Hey guys, Toby Mathis here. Today we're gonna to go over the differences between a will and a living trust. And I'm gonna do a 10,000 foot view just to kind of start off. Number one, we're all tangible human beings, right? We came in here with nothing, we're gonna leave with nothing. And because we're gonna leave with nothing, there's gotta be something that says where our stuff goes because chances are you're gonna die with some stuff. And realistically, there's gotta be a process for who gets your stuff. So there's certain things where you don't have to do anything. Like for example, if I am a joint tenant with right of survivorship on something, if I die, the survivor gets it. It says joint tenant, we own it together. With right of survivorship means if I survive, I get it. So if you're husband and wife, you're married, you own property like a checking account or something, joint tenant with right of survivorship, one spouse passes, the survivor gets it. So that's real easy. But what about something like a house? Maybe I own it and I'm the second spouse. Maybe I own that joint tenant with right of survivorship. First spouse passes, survivor keeps it. And then what happens when the survivor dies? I mean, there's so many little issues I could bring up. Like, let's just say that you're a split family. You each have the pretty bunch, you each have three kids, right? And one of you passes first. What about your kids? If it goes to the surviving spouse and then they give it to their kids and you just disinherited your kids, right? So there's all these little things that come up, but at its top 10,000 foot view, we're really talking about is what happens when the inevitable occurs and something happens. And I'll make it really, really simple for you so that we're keeping it really clean. Number one. There is a process for distributing assets when somebody passes away. And that's if you own assets in your name. And it's a very simple process from a, uh, the in a theory standpoint, which is you're going to court and you're gonna get a court order saying this is who gets the asset. And that's called probate. And probate, because it's in court, is public. In other words, I'm putting something in writing that says, here's where I want it to go. Now you end up probating as well if you don't have any instruction, like Prince when he passed away, had no instruction, so you end up under state law. It's called intestate. But here, we're gonna assume you took the time to do a writing, and we're just gonna compare the two. Here's a will where I'm giving directions of where I want my assets to go when I die, and here's a living trust. And here's a little trick. It says living for a reason because it starts immediately when I sign it. And all it is is really three parties. I'll do my little three number. Number one, it's the grantor. It's me, me, me and my spouse if, it, if I'm married and I'm putting it into trust. I'm overseeing it via being a trustee. That's who's in control of it. So I'm giving it to the trust in a contract. I'm overseeing it as the trustee and then it's going to beneficiaries. During my lifetime, my spouse and I are beneficiaries, or if you're a single person, it's just you, and you could be the trustee. And then what happens is you have instructions so that if something happens to you, hey, I can no longer make decisions on my own, I, have, I lack capacity, uh, I'm incapacitated, and I, like let's say that I'm in a coma, and I can't make decisions for myself, the living trust is already in existence and it just designates what happens if I can't. So like my spouse would make financial decisions on my behalf if, I, if I'm not conscious, if I can't do that. And that's a living trust. A will, really importantly, does not. A will is there when you die. It's only effective when I pass away and it's only effective for distributing the assets. So that's number, like that's, that's a really critical starting point. A will requires you to go through the probate process. A will gets probated. A living trust does not. And as a result, you don't have a public hearing, so it is what we call private. If you value the privacy, if you don't want the world to know what is in your estate, or if you're talking with your parents and you say, hey, your parents are saying, hey, should I do a will or a living trust? You might wanna say, hey, the living trust, because. I don't want all my assets, everything you own, mom and dad, I don't want that all in a public record. I don't want there to be, hey, let's, let's, you know, let's see what they have. Let's see what the Joneses got, right? So that's number one. Wills are a public instrument. It's out there. Living trust is private. 
That's a big one. A will is effective upon death. This is sad, but I actually have a practitioner that does probates and they do wills all the time. And they're like, it's actually really nice because if I screw up, there's nobody there to sue me, right? If I screw up, the client doesn't know. The client's gone. I'm just dealing with the family, right? So it's, it, oh boy, whew, I don't have a, don't I'm not worry about malpractice and things like that, right? A living trust by this little guy up here is effective during your life. So it's immediately superior because it's covering the entire gamut. So if I was going like this, if I was saying like, here's all the way to, here's death, here's life, and then here's, uh, here's your legacy. The will only takes place here. A living trust covers this, covers this, and even creates a legacy. And we'll talk about that in a second. So public, effective upon death, living trust, private, and is effective during your life. Will requires probate. It requires the court process, which is why a lot of people don't like the will and living trust does not. So it's personal. Your family is just taking care of it. It's all personal. You don't have to go through a court. We're not asking a judge to distribute assets. Um, and it's, it, it's very straightforward as far as uh, when I'm dealing with institutions, they're gonna ask to see your trust documents. A lot of times you only have to show them a certification of trustee. So for example, with spouses, it's really easy, but when both parents have passed and maybe it's a, a future, uh, maybe uncle is the, tr the uh, trustee, maybe it's a bank, maybe it's a professional trustee, maybe it's a lawyer, maybe it's an accountant. It could even be an heir, though I don't like it to be an heir. All they have to show is that they're the successor trustee and now they're standing in shoes and handling everything that was in that trust. Wills, however, are very simple. It's die and distribute. If something happens to me, here's who gets my stuff. Something happens to me, here's who gets my car. Something happens to me, here's who gets my real estate. I have a business, here's who gets my, my, my business. I'm not holding it for a long period of time. I don't have any conditions like, hey, you can't be a drug addict. Hey, you can't be suffering from alcoholism. Hey, you can't be going through a divorce. Like there's no restrictions I can put on there. Or we call it health education maintenance in, in, in uh, support. The HEM standards, I can't put it in trust saying, hey, don't give my entire estate to my kids because they might blow it. Statistically, they have an 84% chance of not having that. Like windfalls people blow within three years. They usually have 16%, I believe was the average in the last study I saw after a period of three years. So like they tend to really go through that money quick. That's because they get the money, they blow it because they buy the big house, the really nice car or whatever they pay. They use it to buy something. Right? They're usually they're not looking at it saying, let's preserve it for future generations. That's just how the stats back up. A trust is custom. So if I want to put in there, hey, it's there for education. So any of my future generations, any of my descendants, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids, my great great grandkids, like there's money there for all of them to allow them to go to school or allow them to travel internationally, enable them to do mission work. You fill in your blank, whatever your values are, you can put into that document and that's how you create a legacy. You can customize it with a living trust. You cannot customize it with a will, period. The will is go to court, here's who gets the assets, court signs off, here's who gets everything. They're not holding it, unless you create a, uh, what's called a a testamentary trust where you create a trust when you die, which is kind of silly. You may as well do it while you're alive. Um, but otherwise, that's, it's, it's not there. Now, here's where you actually use a will. And by the way, you always do a will with a living trust. We call it a pour over will. And what we do is we name the living trust the sole beneficiary but you don't do a living trust when you do a will. 
right? So we do a will with a living trust, and here's why. Because there's certain things that you want the public to know. I want the public to know who the guardian of my kids are, right? I want that in a document so that if something happens to me and I want them to be raised by my friends as opposed to my brother, right? Or, you know, somebody from, I'd rather that it be somebody in my community versus a family member. I want that to be able to be filed in a public document like a will. So I will put that in there. I will put burial instructions. Do I want uh, cremation or do I want burial? I'll put that in a will because I want that to be public. I want the world to see that. I'm not worried about hiding that. How about guardian? Uh, well, I already said the guardian for my kids. There's the, uh, I think those are actually the, the only ones that I would really be focusing on is making sure that I have somebody there to watch my my, my minor children and, and uh, just a bit, uh, the disposition of my remains. So those would be the guys that would actually be in, in, in the public. And then I name my living trust. That'd be the third thing is that I name my living trust as the sole beneficiary of my state. So I want to make sure that you're putting that out there. So everybody sees, hey, there's a living trust. It's not like, so you don't have your kids going up saying, I'm the sole heir. No, I'm sorry. It's pretty clear. You're probating the will. They're going to say, let's see the will. And they're going to see a living trust. They're like, you're not on here. <laughs> Sorry, but let me see the trust document. And that keeps firm any shenanigans from recurring. So you do have a will when you have a living trust, and that throws some people off. Uh, I will say this, during your lifetime, so when we're talking about here, there's health issues that you might be facing, and that's when you use a power of attorney for health care. You would use that. That's almost always part of a living trust. In fact, I can't think of a single time in the last 25 years where I've done a living trust where it didn't include the health care provisions, HIPAA release, your health care power of attorney or advanced directive, depending on what state you're in, living will, which says, do I want extraordinary measures taken? Like you're putting in writing, hey, pull the plug, don't pull the plug, that type of thing. I'm, I'm letting my wishes be known. That does, that's, that's part of a living trust. That is not part of a will. Although if you feel like you're going to do the will, like you do these, you know, $99 will, why are they doing that, by the way? Think about it. Why would I do a $99 will? Because I'm going to get this work when you pass. And I'm going to get to bill at that time. In some states, it's statutory. It could be like 8% starting off. So, you know, somebody has a $100,000 estate, it could be an $8,000 fee to the personal rep and the, and the lawyer. So they're like, oh, this is great. You know, I'll get paid later. As opposed to, hey, a living trust might be a little bit more in the very beginning, but it's going to save you 10 times that amount uh, on a typical estate. It's going to save you probably more than that uh, if you actually use the living trust. And it's going to cover everything from financial decisions if you're incapacitated, healthcare decisions, who's going to advocate for you if you're not able to make decisions, who's going to make life-ending decisions that you put it in writing and make sure that somebody's there to enforce it, who's going to have access to your medical information, if you're not able to make decisions for yourself, it's, again, it's easy if, easy if you have a spouse. gets a lot more difficult if you're relying on somebody who's not your spouse. Like you're relying a brother, sister, cousin, friend. That needs to be in writing and there needs to be a HIPAA release so that the doctors can actually communicate with them. You have your schedule of gifts. Hey, here's specific items I want to go to somebody. That's also included in here. So there's just a lot. You might also put in there, here's how I want my uh, ceremony to be whether it be a wake, whether it be a celebration of life, whether there actually be a funeral, I could also put that in there. Again, a will is just a simple document that everybody somehow equates to an estate plan and it only does one thing and that one thing only occurs when you die and then you're very limited in your options of what you can do. So I'm not a big fan of wills by themselves. I am a fan of them when you combine them with a living trust, but I love creating legacies and I also love being very specific in my instructions so again, it, it's all up to you, but I would say everybody could benefit from a living trust in some way because you have the healthcare provisions, you have the financial condition, uh, you know, financial power of attorney as well during your lifetime. So if anything happens to you, you have somebody there advocating on your behalf. I've been a court appointed guardian before and I've used the end of life dis decisions where we had somebody who said, do not let them terminate my life early. And I can tell you on one client alone over 11 period, 11 year period, three different occasions, I prevented the discontinuation of medical care. 
It's not always a certainty. You're usually doing a balancing test. And in her case, she had instructed me that she wanted extraordinary care. And in her case, thank God, uh, it actually was something that was needed. She actually passed away of natural causes in her sleep. So like she would have ended her life, I think it was seven years from, from the first time, seven years early, had we not had that in writing and, and had she not had somebody designated. And by the way, we saw this stuff during the pandemic where you had do not resuscitate orders and things like that. You had to have something in writing to overrule that. You had to have somebody designated to make that call to override. Otherwise, in many situations, and again, I don't want to go back in time and re rehash this thing, but in, in, I, you could say with almost certainty that there are folks that would still be with us today had they not had those orders in place. And it was a, a figure of necessity, but if you don't have an advocate pushing back on these things sometimes, then, you know, you might be checking out early. Some of you guys may be cool with that. Like, hey, pull that plug. If I got a bad cold, pull that plug, right? No, just kidding. But you, you, you want to have somebody who is there to help make that decision for you and on your behalf, as opposed to just leaving it up to, uh, you know, leaving it up to uh, the doctors of the hospital. So anyway, so hopefully that gives you a better idea of the differences between a will and a living trust. If you like this kind of information, please share it with others. If you know of anybody who's dealing with this issue right now, share it with them. Uh, subscribe if you like this type of content. And if you want to ask specific questions, do so in the, in the Q&A below. Leave a comment. And if you have a topic that you want me to hit, you can do that as well. And if you like this content and you want it just to show up and, and notify you, you click that little bell too and it'll let you know when I put up new videos, which is usually two or three times a week. Until that time, thank you for watching and I hope you've been better off now knowing the differences between a will and a living trust.